Welcome back to the Stag Raw Podcast, episode 205. We've got Saren back from Hamels. Saren and I enjoyed a delicious Heineken on a boat in the car park of Tripture Marine. <laughs> Lots of fun. We had hoped uh, either last year to get out on a boat um, over there at the uh, Two Mile Yacht Club, but if you know anything about the North Island summer or what that period it's supposed to be summer was like no it wasn't too conducive to uh, getting out on a boat on Lake Topol but nevertheless here we are at the end of winter um, sitting in a boat having a good chat catching up on where Hamels has come as they've amalgamated with Trip to Marine and what that means for the company it's pretty exciting stuff um, of course coming up they have their expo there in Topol with a few of the other um, retailers around the town so if you're in the basin, in the central plateau, come along to that, um, and yeah, we just sort of check in with Sarah. And I know you enjoyed the first one a lot. Um, that was one of the most popular episodes last year. Our, our podcast with Sarah, um, and yeah, so I thought I'd get him back on um, and touch base. Of course, if you want to get a twenty percent off Arepa, chuck in the code Stagraw at uh, checkout on their website. Um, especially if you're ordering the powder or the brain shots or the capsules, um, 20% off goes a long way. Or if you just like to get yourself a cheeky stash of the brain drink, um, yeah, Stag Raw will get you 20% off. So without further ado, let's crack into it. Uh, episode 205 of the Stag Raw. Enjoy. Make sure you've left the rating. You know, helps us out. Um, we cracked the 75. Thank you so much. Um, on to 100. Cheers. <music> I was about to, about to say that to have a way. The Makeda. Is there a bottle opener function on it? No. No, but it just. Clip. Yeah, I, I saw you do that the other day on your on the Instagram. The clip. Um, if you're watching this, there you go. It's got the clip on it. The tried and true German Mercator. Oh, I haven't had a Heineken in a very long time. They are a great beer. Let's try and get you sorted out All here, right. Saren. And don't rock the boat. <laughs> oh, what? Give it a big wind up. Use, use a big, strong um, engineering hand. Good. Uh, keep it up, keep it up, keep close, it in there. Close, keep it good. In there. Cheers, Saren. Nice. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Yeah, this Thank is you. awesome. What are, what are we on? I just saw a. A Benetton. Correct. I reckon I was, I was over at, um, have they had this on the lake? Yes, they actually have three of these here in New Zealand. Um, these are really popular in the States. Yeah. Very well known in the States. As lake a pontoon cruises. Boat. Yeah. yeah. Very well known as lake cruises. Um, bit of a party boat, family boat. I've got great expectations for these. I imagine Christmas Day on this. Yeah. Or birthdays. Yeah, I don't know if it was. Way cool. I don't know if it was one of these. It might have been. There, there was two over at the Yacht Club. Um. A couple, couple of months back we, we had breakfast there I don't know I don't know how we managed to wrangle that mm. There was no kids So Free morning Maybe that was when I was on garden leave <laughs> Perfect must, time When you got no kids You seemed to have a bit more time for that, stuff eh? That must have been That must have been when I was on garden leave And yeah they had two of these Sitting over at the yacht club That's what That's when we talked last year About repeating the podcast Because everyone enjoyed it so much At the start of last year Because yep. what you're saying We should Get a stabian behind the um, pontoon And it just, well, just yeah, rained. It just it rained all freaking summer. It's something like um, possibly episode two of the story of where Hamels has gone, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. It's been good. It has been good. Um, yeah, incredible little journey, I guess. Um, we should start it off a bit of a funny story, though. Yeah. What's I was thinking about thinking about this today. I, I don't know what the relevance is on it. It's okay. But um, I, I was born in a very small town in Australia, yeah. in far north Queensland, at the top of Australia. Um, crazy place, Mossman, just sort of beside Cairns. Moss, Mossman in Southland is the deer capital. There's, okay. a, there's one of uh, Mary Matushka's tr- um, sculptures there of a, of a, of a deer, but continue yeah. Mossburn, Australia, near yeah. Cairns. Um, yeah, Port Douglas, a well-known place now, but when I grew up there, it was very, very unknown. So 
Anyway, my dad was a bit of a freedom type guy and he built this house on top of the hill which overlooked all these cane fields. Yep. And they used to burn the cane fields off and such. But anyway. Did it stink a toad? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's another great story actually. <laughs> toad venom. Very popular in China. <laughs> yeah. Try exporting that. Anyway. So in these cane fields, there was a whole manner of wild animals and there used to be a whole lot of pigs in there. Yeah. So the pigs would go through and rip it all up. So to counteract that, the farmer got a whole lot of dogs so there'd be these wild dogs running through just chasing pigs constantly oh not pig dogs just let some just dogs loose let some dogs loose it's pretty it savage sounds like uh, the original um, New Zealand ecology you know? <laughs> yeah. well it's let, probably like an let episode, episode let some possums from the and rabbits Simpsons, so. and, um, oh shit let's see that yeah. some states and so anyway we lived on top of this hill it was basically just a roof we had a long drop toilet I don't even think I'd seen a flush toilet until I was like <laughs> 10 years old um, anyway so these dogs were scary, and I remember having to walk up the driveway, which was a really long driveway, and you'd always hear the pigs or the dogs or the snakes or there was something going on, basically living your childhood in fear. <laughs> so my dad, in all of his wisdom, decided to keep these dogs, because the dogs would come up around the house, keep yeah. the dogs away from the house. You'd get these geese. So yes. this, this whole ecology thing is evolving here. We've gone from a couple of pigs, which were a worry, to the dogs, which were a worry. <laughs> So my dad got these geese, and we had these geese which would hang around outside my house, and I've got these memories of coming home, walking past the pigs which were getting chased by the dogs, ending up at home with these geese which would lift their wings and honk and, at you and, and honk bite you. at me. So it was quite an experience there, living and growing Did up they bite through you? that. No, I never got bitten from them. I don't think they hung around very long. I think the whole family was pretty scared of these damn things. And I imagine my dad picked them up somewhere cheap after a conversation at the pub or something and brought these geese home. It's like the little old lady that swallowed a fly there. It was, a, yeah, it was a really interesting time in my life. And I think that really gave me the drive for the outdoors and passion and yeah. animals and all that sort of stuff. Back then it wasn't about hunting. It was about... <laughs> surviving. Yeah, surviving in animals. Um which kind of makes me really grateful for what we've got here in New Zealand, mm. being being able to do what we do. Uh, it's really cool. But yeah, that was a little neat story about growing up in Queensland. Yeah, pretty man. cool place. Pretty neat stuff. And so, how did you end up in New Zealand? Uh, probably just a pretty av- well, pretty sort of normal thing, I guess. Um, parents divorce, separate, and then my mum comes back to New Zealand, yeah. and yeah, straight into a pretty hectic school cycle in New Zealand, going from really small country yep. type towns with aboriginal children and no learning structure whatsoever into mainstream here in new zealand at takapuna in yep. the north shore that so was right pretty into the intense. city yeah it was it was game changing <laughs> growing up in bare feet bare feet and a t-shirt and mm-hmm. shorts that was it It was incredible um really relaxed lifestyle in australia it was a bit of a hippie kind of yep. throwback i imagine i'd liken it to great barrier island but tropical mm-hmm and then straight into the mainstream here in New Zealand. First time I'd seen traffic lights and all that sort of carry on. So it was a big change for me, that. Yeah. And what, were you farming up there? Or? Um, no, my father was a builder. Um, yeah. And my mum had a small retail shop selling clothing on the waterfront where it was the big silver ferry would go out to Great Barrier Island. Yeah. <clears throat> so Port Douglas was a gateway to the Great Barrier Island. Yeah. I've got some pretty good memories of just sort of getting put on that ferry and going out for the day by myself and snorking around and coming home. And everyone kind of knew who you were. It was, it was an incredible way to grow up. So did you fish there? No, I never fished no. there. Did you never fish in Auckland? Fishing. Oh, I loved fishing in Auckland. Haraki Golf, a lot of fishing. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really cool time in life, um, hanging around Haraki Golf, fishing there. And But it was a trade-off. It was either that, I'd, I'd spend my time between fishing and trying to get into Topol. Mm-hmm. So I, I dreamt that much about living in Topol that it came to a point where I had to do it. Mm-hmm. And that's was, what we talked about last time. Mate. Yeah, it's like driving down here and doing all that, and yeah. you know, sooner or later, if you're thinking about something that much, you've got to make the call and just do it. I yeah. mean, nothing's irreversible. You can always go back onto what you're doing and check it out. So, um, if anyone's thinking about doing something, stop thinking about it and just sort of do it and get into it. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's sick. So, I guess that not thinking about it and just doing it. How did you decide to get off the main street, which? I sort of thought that that new traffic way with parking and things might open up that main street, but it seems that more and more shops are closing on. Well, they, I see the old um, the old New York hot dog and ice cream set up shop on the main street oh, now. Oh, so, now. Oh, yeah. that's cool. He's a really neat guy. I love what he's doing. Hey, look, you know, um, I, I have no idea on how things progress or in which way they... I, I kind of just sort of look at the stars a lot of the time, and <coughs> uh, that probably doesn't sound right. It, it, it just <coughs> progressed. It just sort of happened, and... 
in one way or another, Hamels had outgrown its location and needed to move on. And You were packed in there. <laughs> yeah, we were packed in there, and it was surprising. We've moved into a bigger premise, and I don't know how we packed it all in there. It was so well organised over the five years that we were in there, moving <laughs> into a bigger premise here with these boys. I was like, oh man, where, that all that gear, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so it, and we've grown again some more added to it it had come to a stage where the website especially had become it, um, it, it grew to a stage where it just needed more products yeah I was about to, to say does, that, uh, does this allow you more warehousing space Stop yeah space. It, it, there's a lot more warehousing space there is actually another whole inwards goods area which we call the DC um, where we store products and then we can feed the shop and feed the online the online comes out of that shop um, really cool strategies and really cool ideas and just a natural progression for Hamels to go that way. Mm. All myself and my wife, and same with Terry, it was all just pointing in that direction. Yeah, um, yeah. I had, I'd sort of, um, it had always been on the back of my mind that something had to change or had to happen, and I'd sort of been keeping an eye on the other players in the game, what they'd been up to, and I knew that aligning with someone rather than competing with everyone mm. would be a smarter move for both teams I think there's some probably really good sayings about a tide lifts all ships yep. or something yep um, and to be honest rising tide yeah, yeah. rising tide all that um, I kind of got really tired of battling everyone I was the little player down there taking on the big boys and that got me a lot of credit with a lot of people and a lot of support I don't think that was going to last forever hmm. there's only so long you can stand on your soapbox and shout at people for loyalty and support in the end you ultimately have to have the products and the service hmm and give give them a run for their money. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just sort of relying on friendships to keep a business going. <laughs> and, and, and sooner or later, they want something for free. You, yeah. you know, margins are tight, numbers are hard. Um, I think I get the feeling that New Zealand's sort of getting filled with product now. We've got a lot of offshore companies coming in and selling. So, uh, the strategy to move in with Trip Terry and join forces was the perfect thing to do. And it'd been on my mind for a long time. Um, I'd sort of approached Brock about it a while ago and it probably took about two years to happen mm. and I think he was probably on the trajectory where he was interested on getting into hunting gear. It makes perfect sense. you got boats all through summer and I see the same customers coming in. The guys who are buying the big stabies are coming in and picking up the rifles or the ammo. It's just the perfect scenario. Like, where else are you going to go? Yeah, so realistically, you, you, the two of you had the same clients. Yeah, They're just ultimately. Now in the, in the ultimately same place. And I knew we were competing against each other so as soon as I moved in here, I was like, oh, jeez, oh, good day, bro. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're up here now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's bloody handy, isn't it? Um, and, you know, these are these are kind of people aligned in a lot of ways. They've both got children similar in ages. Um, there's the two brothers, um, Reese and Brock. Um, they're on the same page with children and sports and what they get up to. And the whole ethos is what you'd say on, you know, customer service and experiencing the outdoors was on the same sort of agenda the yeah. same sort of point of view these guys are here for a lot of fun and i kind of enjoy my job mm. and that's what it was about ultimately having fun with what you do and sharing that experience that's the only way you get to jump and do 360s eh? yeah you gotta have enthusiasm <laughs> enthusiasm for it or be a little bit crazy eh? were they, were they doing uh, content before you, you joined them um, yeah, they had they had a pretty big platform, but it was more business orientated content, as in I think a lot more on sort of trade me. Nothing on the Instagram or the gram, whatever you want to call it. Um, they had a they did have a website going. Um, yeah, so I think that's where kind of Amy and I sort of really helped it out, or the Hamels sort of came in and helped that out and pushing on that. And mm. I think there's a lot more in there. I don't even think we've really touched the surface on it yet. Yeah, because when you first joined in, you guys launched that big comp, you took Heli Seeker and mm. went out to that hut and you know made, yeah. some, made some footage oh, and you know like one day you're there for, uh, you know Amy and I and we were I don't know giving away a t-shirt or something okay like woo <laughs> <laughs> um, and then next minute there's like Heli Seeker so you know these guys are all mates from school and all hang out together so there's there's some really strong alliances there yeah so being able to pick up on that is incredible though do we know how far off the um, mountain biking is Heli man mountain biking no. I saw old Thomas was in Europe, so <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know how much uh, mountain bike tracks were getting made while he was gallivanting around Europe. But. It is happening. <laughs> we actually we did a um a oh, what was it a business after five in Turangi. We've got a Trev Terry. There's a store in Turangi as well. So we did a business after five sort of thing there, and is that RAL was there. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about you know sort of probably along the lines I'm talking about where you've got to have your fingers in a few pies. Mm. 
and I think the mountain Rupay will ultimately end up being a really ultimate bike park. I bloody hope so. I saw um, <laughs> the other day Coronet's already got the op- opening um, opening day for mountain biking. Mm. I think I think <coughs> the last couple of years they've made more money in Queenstown from mountain biking than they have from well, this, snow. You know, ultimately this could be a conversation like how many. Um, you know, global warming carry on. How many, you know, how many bad winters can you have until yeah. you finally realise, uh, okay, winter season's really short. So in their winter season, they've got two months to make so many millions worth of dollars. Yeah. And then they sit around on their bums for the other 10 months of the year. And, going, and the trails are already oh, partially there. Yeah, the gondolas are there. Okay, well, you know, we're going to make all this money in two months or we can try and do yeah. something in 10 months. So Well, like, even my brother, so he's into mountain biking, um, for his 40th, one of my 35 years so in two years he's going to go I mean, go to go to Canada yeah. and go mountain bike yeah oh it's massive and mountain like, biking, I'd, like I'd, I'd go to the states you know the western states or, or Canada and go to some of those tacks mm. like you know it's a big field if we could start setting up archery challenge up there as well as mountain biking that'd be, that'd be the, the bee's knees eh? it is and you've got to cater to everyone yeah and like you know it's a big field yeah and this is kind of how I felt with you know when we sat in that uh, in the shop with the winter gear, yeah, it was hard. You'd sit there in summer going, <laughs> "Dude, how am I going to sell this? How many how many sets this, of dude? stubbies and t-shirts am I going to sell?" Yeah, yeah, this is that. So you know, joining up with these guys and suddenly you've got all of O'Brien and all the biscuits and all of the boards and everything. You, you're suddenly busy having Weber as well. It's a huge pull card. So the barbecues. Yeah. yeah. So you know, come summertime, the shop um, it, it changes face. It, it, you know, it morphs into something different. We can spin this around in a couple of days and just have it orientated directly towards boating in summer. Mm. So in, incredible layouts and incredible ideas. Yeah, and I know, like, when it comes into Christmas, like, people would come to Chutiri for the summer stuff, but people around Christmas time are thinking about their raw trip, thinking about that, that tent or whatever, or, yeah. or that GPS or, yeah. or PLB that they need, and it's like, they're in the store, it's you know, the, looking, uh, looking hey, at some tackle, and they're yeah. like, oh, what do I want for How Christmas? can I help you? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, that's what it's about. And you've got to catch your people there and then, mm. while it's sort of happening, eh? Absolutely. No, yeah, it's an experience. It's been cool to watch. Obviously, you had to move a whole store. <laughs> oh, that was a worry. I, I, I was thrown out by it a lot. You know, it, it affected me in so many ways. I, I put my heart and soul, as long, you know, along with my, my staff as well. I guess. Um, thanks very much to them and my wife. But I kind of didn't know how it was going to play out. And the way it played out, I was just. I don't know, it was incredible. It was basically just a truck and a trailer, dumped it all in, dragged it all up here, dropped it all off, and everyone was, everyone was like, oh, car pie, see ya. I was like, whoa, <laughs> hang on a minute. How, okay. Um, this doesn't have a sticker. This isn't priced. The sizes are everywhere. The layout was horrible. You guys have got the same products. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was really upset. I was really thrown by I kind of like to have things in a system and a process. It helps me with anxiety or something knowing where things are and how it works and how to sell it so i was kind of right my back foot and i was probably quite awkward to deal with at the time with the staff and what was going on trying to figure it out and it it, i think a year later i think we're getting somewhere with processes Mm -hmm. like everything changed ultimately the way we ordered things you know i'd be like ringing up ringing up nz asia or hey bro can you send me a couple of binos sweet and now it's like ordering processes and you know it's much more formulated more accurate um so it, I've had to grow with it as well, mm. which has been hard. It's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Some yeah. of these sort of change what your systems were. And that would have been a massive reflection on what systems you had in place and how you know, kind of uh, opening yourself up to doing something different. Like, you know, you got to a level of success and then you're like, oh, we've got to change <clears throat> most of what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got to... You got to progress. It would have been easy to sit there, and I guess people are happy with that, and I think that's a great thing. I think ultimately finding your happiness and relaxing is probably what it's about. Mm. I struggle with finding that, I mm-hmm. guess. So that that leads to these sorts of um, things where you grow and you expand and you tackle and you buy and you kind of conquer or not conquer or just try new things. Mm. I think ultimately, if you are happy with something, you wouldn't progress. I don't know. Is it is it that complicated? Is there anything wrong with just being happy with yeah. what you're doing? Probably not. Have you been fishing and hunting more? No, less. Less? Yeah. Um, <coughs> my kids are of an age now where they take up more of my time and I'm sharing more time with them, which I'm really fortunate for. I don't have so much time for myself as, mm-hmm. as such, which I'm happy with. I think, 
you know, hunting and fishing is a sport that you can do at your will. Mm. I don't think it's like a fitness thing where, you know, if you want to do a marathon or do a CrossFit or something, you've got to do it every day. Mm. I think um, hunting caters... Speaking of CrossFit, they're making a record over the road. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite good having them there, eh? I should do some classes in the morning, eh? <laughs> Get um, on that wobbly. But, you know, you can pick it up and leave it when, yeah. when you want and get back to it. So, you know, to be honest, I've probably dropped it a little bit, mm-hmm. but I'll get back to it. Yeah, it's the season on it, isn't it? Like, it was something new and took a lot of dedication. Like you said, good year of finding your feet again. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, that sort of took priority, right? Like, you know, obviously income and paying the bills <laughs> was sort of first. I would love to just sort of hang around the bush all day and grow a beard and get a bit weird and write a poet or something. Yeah. I don't know, but ultimately someone had to sort of come to work. Yeah, yeah, the old Murray, Murray Baldness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hang out in the Importer Keep pub and just steal, steal a bunch of bunch of good yarns <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> write a book on it yeah write a book on it. yeah I've had, I had plenty of people in, in Tokoros tell me about when they go and strike at the mill and so they go over to a Potiki and make their month's wages in a in a week with whether that was tails or skins or, or carcasses and you know they'd get into the pub and Murray Ball would be sitting there and you know you'd hear hear stories or hear yarns and then you'd you know a year or so later you'd pick up his next book and sure enough there was that yarn <laughs> yeah I th- I've heard of that about um, a couple of the authors I was trying to think of one in particular but some of them just had more nows and writing it down yeah they probably all were someone else's story and all just stretched a little bit oh well, that's, that's what makes a good story isn't it can't, can't let uh, the truth get in the way of a <coughs> good story <laughs> no not at all everything's a little bit embellished though of yeah. course yeah and so, you know, we were talking about it uh, on Saturday with your with your knife sharpening test. Yes, um, it, yeah. That old Kiko Road not being there has just meant that drive's just that little bit further both ways, isn't it? It sure is now, yeah. It, it's a little bit further to get to the favourite hunting spots now. Well, actually, they're gone. You can't yeah. get to Kiko Road, can you? Well, it should come back. Mm. Oh, it definitely will come back at the moment. It's closed. I heard something horrendous about the amount of logs coming out of there, trucks. I think it's, 32 I, extra crews or something. Yeah, it's intense. It's a lot coming out of there. That's road. why the, this pollen around here is fucking nuts. Oh, no, I kind of got. But funny, it was a uh, Josh James put a post up about how great pollen was. Oh yeah, so the idea is that you go and you know grab those juvenile cones and get like a plastic bag on them and shake them, and you'll end up with like a plastic bag full of mm. this yellow, the yellow powder that's fucking everywhere. It's got to be digested. Yeah. yeah, as you can see, looking around here, um, <laughs> I don't think, you probably can't see it all, but there's, there's a lot of boats in here and they're all outside and it actually damages, it, it's just so much work washing it off all day. Yeah, it's in that little crease over there. Um, the, the driveway is actually like bright yellow with yeah. pollen, even at home, the cars are just covered in it. Yeah, and so yeah, you, you then make a tea out of it. Boost testosterone apparently. Got to be in dish, in je- you can't, sniff it right it's just going to no. ruin you yeah <laughs> I when I when I moved to Topo like I was close to moving out of Topo it ruined me in so many ways to like so it, it just starts as a bit of a sniffle puffy yeah. eyes and then after maybe two to three weeks of that you start coughing because your lungs are full of phlegm this sounds disgusting it's like old man disease stuff eh? um, and then you're just coughing that much you can't sleep and then your eyes go all black and dark so then you take antihistamines to try to get rid of it antihistamines make you sleepy so then you boost up in the coffee <laughs> Then you're wheezing at night and you're sleeping on the couch upright just trying to, <laughs> I need some bloody sleep. I ended up getting the um, injections and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's why I, 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 last year I took antihistamine, but that was around the same time I got that like 90 day cough mm. and that was not a good look. And so I was like, oh, I should yeah. take the antihistamine and that got rid of both. This year I gave myself a week. So I went hunting on my birthday and then that weekend was when it really started to kick mm. off and I got pretty sniffly and congested. But this reminds me of like the a, a secret power station somewhere just ruining everyone's health in a small town. Like, is there a movie about <laughs> they say and that you yeah. know, the, the water's poisoned and no one wants to know about it? So you walk into any chemist in Taupo, the first thing at the counter is antihistamines <laughs> and and nasal wash. Yeah, uh, like a, it's just so rife here. Like every second person in the doctor's room is like getting injected or on prednisone to try and get rid of a cough or infected chest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, they need an apothecary here. Uh, when I was in Christchurch, there's one in um, Wollston at the. It's called the Tannery. And there's an apothecary there, and they just gave me like a bag of tea that had like all the local yeah. stuff in it. Oh, yeah, I was doing that, and like spoonfuls of honey, like <laughs> <laughs> rubbing shit everywhere, just trying to make hay fever go away. Um, 
But the saddest thing about all this now is I kind of see my kids walk around snotty nosed all the yeah. time and sneezing and coughing. Uh, uh, you can't put them on antihistamines or anything, right? Yeah, yeah. No, Hopefully, you, you kind of just grow out of it. That's the idea. On. That's the idea. I have plenty of people at work being like, what am I allergic to? And I'm like, have you like, yeah. looked around? So I, I saw that post and I was like, you're welcome to come here and scoop it off my windshield. Like, you don't <laughs> even have to go. Oh, Josh James's post. Yeah. yeah. Um, Amy's father got a really interesting photo like from the lake you can actually see uh, Lake Taupo Forestry and on a day like today there's plumes eh you'll just see a yellow cloud yeah. cruising across yeah I think like the lake one year got had all this bloody fungus stuff on it yeah and it was just pollen, pollen on the top on. yeah and it affects like the UV rays going through the water and all sorts eh well I, th- I think from the perspective of the hunters though they should actually be kind of excited about it like talking to people that are in the work at the prison and so mm. they they're doing like the pest control with a couple of the guys from the prison and yeah so they're out on the edges and stuff and just tell me about plenty of windfall and like where i was um last weekend there's a bunch of bits that are opened up and, and clear so there's going to be some good growth yeah okay growth yeah, areas yeah, yeah. So, i see what you're thinking yeah so hopefully it's a bit like a burn you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a clearing and opening up, and yeah. so should well. Not see they do it; they'll burn off Porsche and bring back new growth. Yeah, that's uh, what part that's of part of um, yeah part of the process. Who, who's I was just wondering how many little animals are squashed under all that windfall, do right? Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, that's like animals are pretty intuitive, but yeah, like I we were in the hut in April and when we were talking about like, geez, there was some widow maker trees that had gone down. Mm. Like I I put a video of that big big tow truck that had just hit the deck and just shattered in two like holy heck that's a big, so good that's old a mother big. nature just getting <laughs> some payback right like ain't nothing stronger than that yeah really incredible that was a big tree and then yeah sure enough a couple of steps later i was like ah you bitch yeah, they're, <laughs> they're good at that oh huh? <laughs> you're like yeah. show yourself yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never do never do it's usually just a little white flash running away oh eh? well, it wasn't even there it wasn't even there you've been catching some big fish yeah, I, I kind of, I do quite well with the trout, I guess. Um, I get a bit of help from some good guys. I work a lot with a guy called um, Ian, who's got a page called Addicted to Trout. Mm. So, um, incredible fisherman, like, really good to go out with, like, the absolute guru of it. So, you know, you'd be out there casting for an hour or two, nothing happens, he turns up and goes, bro, switch flies, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, switch out and catch something good. So, yeah, I enjoy my trout fishing for the moment, over the hunting for a little bit, sort of taking the line, the... First thing how long is going for a fish take oh, i can like three hours and i'm home again three hours is pretty you know good as opposed to yeah. the hunt and it's close to home and it, it, it's kind of it's a bit of more of a gentleman sport you don't sweat and carry on or you know you just yeah. basic fly rod and you're off that's it yeah it's not that uh, so much um admin work involved um so yeah really don't have to lock that. a thousand things and lock a thousand things to your car and then unlock yeah. them from your hey, car you know how many people are coming in asking for bolts now because they're losing them yeah they're getting them yeah i've got like three or four bolts you got to chase up and uh, I hate to say it, like a thousand dollars. It's not yeah. cheap, yeah. So don't go losing your bolts, like honestly. So I guess that's like one of the major parts of of the yeah, rifling, pr- isn't cheaper, it? Cheaper, cheaper to keep them in the rifle and take the fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what's, yeah, it, like, what's his name? Like High, High View um, Range down in Nelson. Yeah, he had a TikTok the other day about how, like, it's in terms of a shooter that's potentially dangerous because you might end up if you've got the same type of rifle you might end up putting the wrong bolt well, in the wrong rifle <laughs> yeah possibly totally i guess hey, i imagine there'd be a lot of people who have got tika 270 308 mm. and might be grabbing the wrong bolt i actually haven't tried it i haven't no, tried I, like i, 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 I don't i'm know. sure there's some crossover on some of them but yeah um, that's where i my knowledge of rifling and firearms really plummets <laughs> yeah yeah i i haven't tried it i i guess it would probably load and close i don't know if it would push the bullet forward and extract i don't know i'm not going to experiment with it no i'm not going to try it yeah it, it's complicated things so much uh, probably um yeah firearms and registrations and laws and stuff has been an incredible hurdle mm. and the cost of it the cost of it yeah they did work with sound about Getting, getting, getting a lot more people who well, she, sell her, her, secondhand firearms. Yeah, her, her son's now. under 16, so she got a firearms license, and she's like, holy shit, that was expensive. And then, so, and, and of course, her son's the one that's geeking out on it, mm. you know, knowing all the, you know, dope and, and calibers and all that yeah. sort of stuff, speeds and loads and <laughs> everything. And when he turned 16, heck, like, you know, there was, there was talk of it being a thousand bucks to 
uh, uh, first first firearms yeah license. And, it, and it just takes so long now as well um firearms dealers being a dealer is incredible they've made that so hard mm-hmm. um the storage of it all yeah it, it's it's not an easy game eh? no nah. and i mean to be honest the margins on rifles so minimal uh, uh, <laughs> That's just yeah. That's unreal. Like. The amount of effort which goes into it to try and sell something now is um, yeah, quite hard. Speaking so, speaking of effort, so. you were um, two days flat tack in the beehive at uh, at the Seeker Show trying to sell rifles. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm going to do this year for it. I might even try to team up with Lee from uh, in a while and go help him out. Yep. So yeah, <coughs> excuse me. I actually won't have a stall there this year. That, it's probably a really good conversation. It's really hard for me as a retail shop to turn up and sell products against my suppliers. Mm. So paying for a booth and trying to get everything there. Because you were against, there with, with a supplier last yeah, time. Yeah, so you know, predominantly the only way for me to get there really was to go with a supplier and help them sell, which is kind of really a mess because all I'm doing is stealing my own sales, right? <laughs> Does, does anyone think about this? Does anyone realise how that kind of works for me? I'll go and spend my time there and help someone else sell a product at a show where I could be selling at my own shop. Yeah. Kind of a bit of a subject for me, really. Um, losing it from Topol was quite upsetting. Well, not upsetting, just a shame, I think. Um, I do like where it's gone. I am 100% behind it. I've got the sign up in the shop. I think it did need to grow as well. Mm. Um, I just sort of struggle with it being so close to the... Um, What's the big farmers one beforehand? Sorry, lost for words. Field days. Field days. You know they're at field days and basically leave all their gear left over from field days and carry it on and do the seeker show. You know, um, so for me going there and competing against the people I'm supplying was just sort of really redundant. Like I'd have to buy it at a wholesale and they're selling it at 100% margin, so it didn't really work. I guess I could try and take. I had the idea of taking some unknown Kiwi brands there. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the packs and clothing and sword knives or some of the no-shows um, but buying all the product to take it there for a weekend and try and put it out in a store it's a big undertaking yeah. mm. it's a lot of work so credit to the guys who are going there um, really proud of you and I'm kind of really happy for the guys who do go there I think like some of the little bands like um, I really like seeing Unjustified Risk there mm. um, I think it's great that you know Warfight Athletics there getting their stuff out um, you know, Lee and a Wild, Backlands, mm. um, Mantis, all these really mountain cool, gear. yeah, mountain gear, all these guys, little guys, with glacier the little stand, rifle, glacier yeah. rifle, yeah. Uh, so really good on you guys, and I think the Seeker Show is vitally important for that. Mm. Um, as for the big players, I don't know. Let the little guys ever go away. When it came to the optics guys, like there was plenty of optics guys there. They they are retailing themselves. That's that's why they're there. Yeah, it's an interesting world. Like um. Now that you've got such a big presence with, um, I guess, you know, online sales, once you've got your online sales, it means you can sell direct to the public. So for me, that's quite hard. That's kind of damaging. So, well, not damaging. It just means I've got to compete against them as mm. well. So now that they can do that, now that they're online, it means that they can go to the shows or sell direct to the public. Mm. Yeah, which makes... But yeah, yeah, you've got your your banking on the the touch and feel and experience of it, don't you? Hundred percent, hundred percent, and customer service. That's the one thing. You know, like a lot of people might save a couple of bucks here and there, but I guess ultimately, it is great to speak to someone about the product. I'm not saying you won't get that at the Seeker Show. You won't. You will. You will get that undoubtedly. It's, I think what will happen with the Seeker Show is a lot of guys will know what they want, mm. and they'll go there specifically to buy that one product at a better price. Yeah. And it was kind of awkward. I also kind of felt like, you know, at this time now, it's actually really hard to get what you want. <laughs> so actually thinking that, you know, wholesalers and retailers are going to go there and do a good price on products that they're finding hard to actually stock yeah. is kind of another situation as well. So, you know, going there and trying to sell things at a good price or at a lower price or a discounted price when it's selling really well at a higher price was kind of a hard pill to swallow as well. Mm. Yeah, it was... The numbers were unreal. That was yeah. That was what was great about Mystery Creek, like the captivity of it and what it can hold. Yeah. Um, and being indoors, you know, like uh, in Taupo, you, I always remember it was like wet grass, wasn't it? Yeah. And it stung, eh? Well, there's what was a couple of t- um, basketball courts worth. <laughs> yeah. Now <laughs> it's, it's massive. It's uh, that massive hall. Well, I uh, think New Zealand's deserve it of a show like that. I think it's really big. I think there's another. Um, I think Rotorua is having a crack. Yes, I saw that. Uh, yeah. That so that'll be interesting next weekend or weekend after mm. yeah. then of course we've got our own show at the end of this month so that's probably another good reason just quietly we're going to do our own little expo here in Taupo and 
get involved in that. So we've got a great big servicing centre where the boys do all the boats. Yeah. And we'll just open that brand new servicing centre, massive place, and we'll get all the brands in there and just sell from there. Yeah. Across got, yeah. across the board of across what you the guys, board, everything, yeah. all the rifles and ammunition and clothing and hardware, it'll all be there, same thing. And um, we'll get a couple of the brands which are sort of backing and keen to get in there. So oh, get that sick. going off, yeah. Yeah. And that would be more um, experimental. Like you can come along, get involved with something, and talk to the pros and talk to people about it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think Taupo still deserves something. Okay, it could still have something quite easily. Definitely. It's Central Plateau, man. It's so easy to get to. Yeah, that, and that's kind of brings us on to our next topic. I sort of brought it up with you and you didn't really know too much about it. Old um, Alex Waller, Trippin' and Trout, did a YouTube video on the fact that during the winter he couldn't really make videos anymore because he'd run out of stock footage and he it wasn't economical for him to pay the fee to... to um, to video and make YouTube videos, okay, in the in the forest rivers. So these guys, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not too up to play off that these guys are going to start paying to do this, right? Yeah, and like I was sort of th- thinking about it on the way down this morning. I was like, how much would a, a tourism campaign cost? Whereas these people are promoting it for free. Like how obviously how YouTube works is they've got to make something captivating and appealing and interesting for enough people to watch the video so that they can start getting paid from it. Now, if that then converts a bunch of people to come to Topol, you know, for the likes of your shop, mm. walk into your shop, grab tackle, flies, whatever, um, fill up, eat, shop, um, grab something extra, maybe stay, you know, surely that's what, it's good for the area of Topol. Totally, totally agree with you, man. There ain't no way anyone should have to pay to do that, to do their um, videos or make a living out of, you know, our backyard. Uh, I don't see, I don't, not all I'm aware of, I don't see any of the other clothing brands or big outdoor brands having yeah. to pay a fee. Like, I had always thought, you know, um, uh, probably... But that's, like a, that's right? also like, like a different thing, though. So that's like a... Yeah, would, would you... They're actually, going in their one-off, yeah, yeah. doing an ad campaign, yeah. you know, a lot of the time with a media agency, <coughs> you know, like, for example, barkers go down to, to the desert road and, you know, go into the car park and have some cars and people in clothes and shoot <laughs> a thousand photos and put out yeah. four of them. Yeah. You know, whereas a YouTuber or a content creator, you know, is out there doing something they're passionate about. You know, yeah, yeah, Alex is also hoping to drive some clients, but those clients end up in Topor and hopefully go back to wherever they've come from and say Topol's great for fishing oh look man these guys are showcasing the best of what New Zealand has to offer and it's worldwide you know we should be encouraging these guys and probably helping them with what they're doing not hindering them at, yeah they're, but again they're, like if, if if for example the the iwi or, or the council or whatever was to you know go to Auckland and, and grab such and such and say promote Topol Imagine the amount the of the amount of zeros on that bill. Yeah, it'd be incredible. <laughs> it really would be incredible. Everyone's on the take. That's the worst thing about this. Um, you know, when I when I think about my NCDA fee, my Seeker Foundation fee, mm-hmm. um, my Taupo fishing license fee for my family. Don't forget, I'm doing this four times, mm. and then my boat ramp pass. <laughs> hey, how much of a free world is this now in New Zealand? You know, everyone likes to think that their hunting's free. Where's, you know, you know, like, maybe a hut pass. Like, how many different things are on my payroll for something I might not actually do this month? You yeah. Know? Um, there's a lot of, well, and then you know your range fee every time you go there as well. Like, it's all starting to add up. And I think the saddest thing about this is everyone's like, "Oh, she'll be right." It ain't that much, but you know, come into the week, probably everyone's starting to realise now. Actually, this is this is all adding up on me. It's costing yeah. me a bit now. You know, and then you tank a gas to get there, oh and then your diesel case. Like I can just keep talking about this, and I don't <laughs> think it's because I've suddenly turned a certain age, <laughs> mate. And then you drive from Tokoro to oh. Topo, and I've just built a new road that's got gigantic holes in it. Yeah, and uh, there was three cars on the side of the road with punctures. Punctures. <laughs> Yeah, brand new road. <laughs> I know. So you know, and then you know, there's no train service, and they're cutting all these logs out, so the big trucks are on the road even oh more. Oh my god! Yeah. So it's even more dangerous. Um, yeah, 
could I? I don't know if a government change will even fit. So. Oh fuck no! Uh, <laughs> I, uh, that, that's the unfortunate thing about being on, on. Or it's probably fortunate. It's good. It challenges your ideas. Um, TikTok, you know, shows you a bit more of the of the left hand side of of the aisle. And yeah, they had old Luxy on on there. Just and and uh, Nicola somebody. I don't mm. know. They, they were both digging themselves in holes on with Jack Tame. Yes. Uh, it'll it'll be interesting, you know, as, as it goes at the moment for um, retail or spending. You notice, I think things slow down a little bit this time of oh, year. Oh, mate! So <laughs> we, we, we've gone from being flat out to you know empty appointments. I'm like, where mm. the fuck is everybody? And what are they up, up to? Well, yeah. I think they're all just realising that the lattes are quite expensive, and going, you know, eggs like Jesus Christ. I'm I'm worried about the price of eggs now. Yeah, I'm thinking about chickens. Like, what, I bought what I bought a uh, chick. I bought like we we're looking at like chicken breast. Yeah. And then um, whole chickens, and think. Oh, that's the neighbours. Oh sweet! No <laughs> Thanks coming in to take a boat. Thankfully, I love butchery, so yeah, I'm I'm gonna butcher up butcher up chicken out of a whole chicken. Uh, it's time to be handy with what you got <laughs> and start using your skills, eh? Yeah. You know, like stop being so wasteful. I'm, I'm not very skillful. As, as being consumers as yeah. such, eh? Yeah, like firewood. Yeah, I need to call up my mate and be like, oh, oh we had it. We had a. This is a bit of a. I, I, you know, it's probably a little bit embarrassing. We had a power bill. It was like six hundred and fifty bucks yes. for a month. Yes. Um, that that's two kids with heaters going, oil heaters. I don't think our house is very well insulated, and that was a real eye waker. That was like that was upsetting. That was like, <laughs> how one? How am I going to pay for this? <laughs> two. How do I make this less? Yeah. So in the last month, making it less has actually been really fucking miserable because the heat is not on in the room. Yeah. And I'm having like hot water. Like kids aren't having baths now. That's it. You're, you're into showers, mate. You can share a shower, kids. Uh, <laughs> and that's, know, that's, um, that's been the bonus of uh, back to like the economy of Topo actually having a ski season. But the uh, downside is that it's been fucking freezing. <laughs> yeah. So burning more wood, just doing that, trying to cut things, and I'm just being aware of it now. Just being aware of the cost of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's our old thing. Eh? You like the good good thing about being forward facing and meeting people and dealing with people is you get to hear everyone's stories and perspectives. And then, um, like sometimes, like especially at my job, you just see people react in bizarre ways, and you're like, man, this society's under pressure. Pressure. Well, we get asked like a lot of people are asking for discounts now. Just flat or yeah like what's your best price what about you know can you do anything a little bit better than that i it's an interesting scenario being here now we've got sort of two different um grades of clients i guess you know with the higher end boats and stuff like that mm. um so it, it's kind of more interesting in that aspect eh? some people aren't flinching mm-hmm. some people are just going through it fine and then a lot of people are sort of thinking twice about what they buy yeah no it's, it's um yeah, being public facing is, is interesting. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never thought that that would be a thing as an optometrist that yeah. I'd, I'd be getting like the gauge of the community. Do you find it it, it affects your mood? Like, um, you end up being the brunt for a lot of people's conversations, and you sort of get led down a path and start agreeing, especially on politics. <laughs> yeah. And then you've spent twenty minutes with someone just getting put into the wrong frame of mind. Yeah, complaining about things it's very you know easy to walk down that track I remember my previous job I used to wear radio earmuffs and listen to talk back oh wow and I kind of got to the stage where I just had to switch off from it yeah I just need to get out of these conversations it's not doing me any good and it feels a lot more like that lately um, once upon a time in retail it was more about weather where you're going hunting what's going on yeah now it's more about you know governments and costs and petrol and you know sort of carry on I feel like the tone of New Zealand might have changed a little bit post-covid like yeah so many people are sort of like it's definitely different like i remember I, that that last election during COVID, i you know we had the tar thing and and it was the firearms legislation there's always a fight yeah it was, there's it was always something to battle there's always something to tag but I, haven't, I, haven't, against I haven't found that this much I've, i found like this this is a bit of a nothing a nothingness yeah well i'm i'm banking on a really good summer i think a bit of sunlight yeah, he's, oh, that was the other thing, eh? A summer, of summer of rain. Yeah, you know, I think a bit of sunlight might make a lot of people happier. I ain't never, you know, seen a depressed African, right? They've got a lot of sunlight and they're pretty happy people and they've got far less than us. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that summer was shit. Mm. <laughs> if it wasn't windy, it was raining. Yeah. Yeah. And so, 
let's hope we get a really cool summer and get some great days on the lake out in boats mucking around just sort of being the good old Kiwi lifestyle we used to be yeah without worrying about the cost of gas <laughs> We well, we can do some really economical Yamaha Alpha mm-hmm. Zero. Well, if you believe most people, the, the world's problems going to be solved come uh, October fourteenth. But I don't think that's the case. Is that if I missed the memo? Well, that's, that's, <laughs> you know, no matter who you talk to, the election's going to solve it. We, oh, okay. we're, we're either carrying on or moving on. I don't know what what it is. Oh, well, I was thinking maybe there's world end or something out there. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> yeah, being no, told about. Not not another apocalypse. No. No. no, well, we got through the Y2K thing quite well, 2000. <laughs> 2012, yeah, Y2K. We were you on Y2K? There was a few in 2000? Yeah. I was in Amsterdam, Holland. We nice. Celebrated, yeah, the 2000th year coming in, yeah, in Holland, Amsterdam, playing with firecrackers. Was there any concern that you... No, I'm probably too wasted to care about that, to be honest. <laughs> that was the last of my concerns. Were you travelling? Really? Yeah, travelling. I did a really cool trip. I sort of did, what did I do? I got to 21 did my apprenticeship in automotive refinishing and then sort of took off I had a one way ticket to the UK which was only going to be two years and then I think it was something like 10 or 12 years later Yeah, came back yeah built boats oh I did all sorts of I counted people in stations and underground I did some uh, medical tests um, as in they tested on you yeah you go and take some yeah. pills so I think some of them were placebo so it didn't really matter what happened um, lied yeah. about being a smoker and all sorts of things and just hung out and played a bit of table tennis and <laughs> took some pills and yeah, that was food. it got paid for it cleaned some windows did another job called Itchy Scratchy just putting um, cladding on buildings in Harlesden like a real rough area you say cleaning windows you, were you like up, yeah, up, up on in the grains up on scaffolding putting wool cladding up against brick walls yeah no, it up. no before that the cleaning windows were you in the, in the crane cleaning nah, windows no nothing like that just no. cleaning shop windows I did all sorts of stuff man would you Would you get up there no I wouldn't do that you wouldn't uh, do that no. I would have pro- not now not now a bit nervous so things change <laughs> like, yeah, but back then would you oh hell yeah I would have done anything for a buck back then eh? yeah. I needed money back then Travelling then was cool. That was pre, um, you know, like passports were just a stamp. Yeah. That was neat, man. I went around the whole of Europe, did all sorts of stuff. It was incredible. Ten years of just um, free travelling through Europe. Yeah. As I like, just doing meaningless jobs, really. Oh, and then I got into the boat thing, and that really took off. That was cool as hell. Yeah. Carbon fibre. Yeah, back in the day. No one had really played with carbon fibre, and then, you know, the old Kiwis came in and we sort of changed the game. We had some massive jobs going off through Europe, building these big luxury yachts for our Wally and Oyster yachts. Um, yeah, then got involved in the America's Cup stuff. What's Oyster yacht? Oyster's a type of yacht, a brand of yacht in the UK. Yeah. Big players. So we got involved doing lightweight yachts, um, carbon fibre composites and vacuum bags and that sort of carry on. <laughs> that was cool. It was dreamy, man. Yeah, so cool. Getting paid in euros just directly into your Kiwi bank. There was no... But just hand in your hours and go for it yeah what, what did the tax man think of it um well we kept it under 10 grand everything had to be under 10 grand back then nothing <laughs> bigger than 10 grand could go through your bank account that's what we all thought yeah the, the number was 10 grand if you did 10 grand um a red light would go off so we always kind of kept it tried to keep our hours under that sort of amount <laughs> <laughs> it was good it was good money back then it was incredible and it was it was all in euros and tax free no, no, what, what did well, I see that, uh, today um, Macquarie Bank's no longer holding cash and I'm like what, what are, you, are they even a bank anymore like what's going on <laughs> so yeah back then it was almost like three to one on the euro with the Kiwi dollar yeah that was it was great and how, so, how did they bank it digitally yeah it was all just digital and we just go we had FBOS machines you know yeah. just take it out of a hole in the wall <laughs> and, and um, what was the currency in Italy back then um, yeah it was cool no, it's really cool. It's a great lifestyle. Um, highly recommend traveling. Yeah, but I, th- I, I think it's changed a bit now. Eh? Uh, yeah, I, th- I understand. It's still good times. <laughs> we, we used to travel around, no visas, no work visas for these places. And I remember one day working in Croatia, we'd set up this workshop. We'd get there and have to set it up from scratch. And um, we'd come from Italy. We'd sort of finished in Italy. So we you would have been fine in Croatia, though, right? Just like nah, I, no. I still had an Australian passport, <laughs> and I, pro- I was probably on the wrong side of the fence anyway. Yeah. But um, anyway, so we're all there working away, and all the locals thought we well, were drug dealers because we turned up in BMWs and Volvos from from the did UK. Did you have bum bags? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, probably, I did actually a, a diesel one too. Yeah. Um, so they all thought we were drug dealers, and all the local guys hated us. You know, because we kind of had money in these late model cars and nice clothing and stuff. Um, anyway, working away, and I went up to the bathroom in the offices, and I looked out across the car park into the boatyard, and the police were there. Mm. 
and um, all my mates were getting marched out <laughs> and put in the bloody police cars. I don't know what to do. So I rung, I rung up my um, girlfriend at the time and said, oh God, I think shit's going down. Can you kind of find our passports and maybe think about... So anyway, they arrested us all and took us to the police station in Croatia. No one could speak bloody Croatian. Separated us all into different cells. None of us had work visas and it was a hell of a mess. And we got bailed out by some mobster or something came <laughs> in and tried to explain who we were and what we're doing. And um, they let us go. We, ended, we go, went to court and sort of just got talked through it all. We just had to make an appearance. And then we um, went for a drive into Savinia and got a new stamp in our passport and all came back to work like a week later. And it was all fine. And it was all fine. Yeah, being in the port probably didn't help you. They probably, <laughs> they probably really did think you were smuggling shit. Well, that, the funny thing about this boat building thing in and, 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 uh, the EU and Europe, it was all in the middle of nowhere. So this was in Zagreb, about miles from a coastline. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to explain to people that we're building these carbon fibre race yachts in Zagreb, um, out, of, out of Zagreb actually, um, in like chicken farms, was a really hard story to buy. <laughs> <laughs> that just sounds like money laundry. It, it probably was on a higher scale. It, I think it really was. It was at a time when there wasn't EU countries as such, yeah. and the poorer countries were getting help from the bigger countries to become EU countries. So you kind of turn up and make this boatyard. Like, yeah. um, honestly, turn up and build big concrete slab boatyards with huge ovens in it, teach the locals how to lay carbon fiber composite panels and get them going, probably build two boats, never really worked, take the paycheck, and then move on again kind of thing <laughs> fly back to New Zealand for a holiday and yeah then, yeah go back again avoid the text man yeah. <laughs> oh Jesus yeah if you're at the ID and listening uh, never happened uh, I don't think they'd really care about it too much it's probably bigger fish the price started in UK from the UK uh, went into Italy and then from Italy went into Savinia and then from Savinia went to Croatia heck just yeah border to border it was good fun all just building yeah, yeah. Really neat time. Nice, man. And then came back and opened up a clothing shop in Topol. Yeah. Well, <laughs> did a bit more building. and then Via yeah, Auckland. Yeah, via yeah. Auckland. Did it yeah. my time Go back Auckland. to the first episode, you'll hear, you'll uh, hear about it. Yeah, track back to that one. That was a good one, too. <laughs> nice, man. So, like, now, how, how long does the settling in phase? Do you, you think you're settled? I think we're settled now, and I think the next... The next stage after getting, I'd like to get through the summer and mm. move some product, and then the next stage will be growth. I'd like to see what we can do with the other locations. So Trev Terry's is a is a big company. They've gone through a lot of expansion. They've um, bought a lot of more new locations throughout New Zealand. So the 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 growth strategy would be there, um, and it, it's a big it's a big picture. I think it's a really neat big picture. So. I'm excited about this stuff. That's what kind of turns my wheels. Um, meeting and greeting people, I love it, and the growth. Mm. I think that's kind of what you got to have your um, your mantra as such. Yeah. Is that it? Um, and I think that's where it's at with this. Yeah. And I really needed these guys to help me with that. Yeah. And, and so I, I think I can bring a lot to the party for them as well. And so is your online online stuff pretty nationwide already? Yeah. So the online's always been nationwide and somewhat international. Um, Going international actually crosses a whole lot of boundaries with our suppliers as well because obviously they're international so that just causes another bloody headache, thank you very much, <laughs> with the New Zealand dollar. So a couple of the international buyers from the EU figured out they could be buying products off our website and getting it cheaper than what the supplier was doing it in the UK for. So, you know, I think this is where New Zealand's um, suppliers have flooded New Zealand market. I don't know how many $600 jackets you can sell in a in a community like New Zealand with hunters uh, mm. you, you, you fill the market so there's a couple of brands you know like really good instance is probably Swazi where very smallly known and well known in New Zealand but not as popular same with Ridgeline actually their offshore presence is massive yeah like the, there's one there's one um, I think you got like Jeremy Clarkson rolling around Ridgeline yeah and there's here. like some I think it's like a, a tur hunt in Kazakhstan or something and the guy's yeah. wearing an anorak and you're like and, well, okay. I, I, well, no, I love my Ridgeline clothing but um, you get these English guys coming in here swearing it's the best clothing in the world and where can I buy it and you know like it, it, it's intense they purposely come to New Zealand while they're in New Zealand and buy to buy up on Ridgeline clothing because it's cheap yeah, yeah. Like, I, can't, I can't wait to see game gear rolling around in the game parks of <laughs> Africa <laughs> with the big tusks yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah really interesting you know like I don't know the exact numbers of it but when you think of the millions of people in the UK or America mm. um, 
the, the the hunters there would outdo the population in New Zealand. Oh, mate, alone. Mar- so, markets. Say, like oh, I've talked to like John O'Lister with race car driving, um, Simon Cochran in in um, you know he's doing Ultraman. He's yeah. broken the world record of that. You know, he won Canada. Had he been a US athlete, he would have been sponsored. Oh, getting getting fifth, fifth place at the yeah. Topo I man here. Yeah, okay, so you know, even when um, we're on the America's Cup game, and I was on the America's Cup game, no one wanted New Zealand to win, and it solely came down to sponsorship money. Yeah. Ain't no one in America going to be watching TV at three in the morning to watch the America's Cups. Yeah. You well, it's yeah, so like Element, you know, I, I always said to them, like, hey, you know, there's a bunch of people in New Zealand that still want to buy the product, would you be interested in a wholesaler? And they're like, no, it's all right. Mm. Like five, you know, five million total that's cute that's, yeah. that's like so, you small, know, people, small people are asking me about ammunition why have you not got ammunition here why can I get that caliber so you know technically um, one of the big stores in the states could probably sell what New Zealand gets in a year they'll yeah. do that in a weekend so trying to send a container here and get tangled in laws and for a very small margins at, at the cost of getting it here yeah they'll just you can sell it out through the states real quick and certain, certain calibers got turned into uh, were the same in handgun ammunition so the lines made it handgun ammunition so then the, the hunting ammunition didn't get made mm. and like you say I guess we're I the ones that did I get made did, went to well I, I imagine I think they just run pretty different bloody calibers to us to it anyway yeah you know I don't think they quite I think they're all more about their PRCs and their 6.5s right rather than 308s I yeah 7.08 right. yeah are they still making um, arms and in, in ammunition in, in England I'm or unsure I'm you unsure. Don't know. No. Yeah. But um, what I do know is, for whatever got banned, they've made some pretty cool stuff to make up for it, eh? You know, yeah. like some of these straight pull 223s, <laughs> mean looking rifles. Yeah. Like, pretty cool. So, there, there is still some pretty cool weapons out there. Oh, I shouldn't say weapons, eh? No. Firearms. Firearms. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, reading Banwell's Red Deer Part 1 at the moment, mm. and so that's basically been about Germany, UK, Park park hunting park mm. licensing you know gentry hunting and things like that and you know well, i don't know too much about it but i understand it's kind of like that caliber for that that animal yeah you know and oh you've you've got the animal to shoot so there's the gun that you're allowed to buy and the caliber you're allowed to buy and go do it i don't know what happens after you've you've shot the animal like you have to go oh. give it back again <laughs> i watched um cam you know hunter's journal had a really interesting trip over to finland yeah <coughs> is that when they went to uh, Swaro? Yeah, in the Sarko factory in Sarko, and they yeah. put them on a onto a game driven hunt. Yes. It looked really interesting and the way they treated the animals afterwards with the respect and while they butchered them. Yeah. Pretty good. Like I, you know, I think you could New Zealand could probably learn a lot from that. Yeah, not necessarily the method of hunting, but the the um, processes of before yeah. and after. Yeah. All the kind of rules. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I love those Ben Well books. How you like tells massive story like history of of it of the animal where it's come from how it's evolved you know in this in this one it's you know red deer he's he, he was obsessed with red deer like he's yeah. obsessed with all deer but oh everyone's got their animal though yeah but red yeah. deer was what he's obsessed with being scottish and you know yeah. being from gore and you know Dineen and things like that but um he goes like into bloody bc and the romans and where, really? where everything's been and shit like that yeah He's nuts for a day. Wish he was still around. What a, what a legend. Yeah, yeah, good. I, I, I just finished the book as well. That was really good. It was about the um, other guys, uh, Red Stag Timbers Club. Oh, yeah. Cool book. Good read. Yeah. Probably a little bit slow on that. Probably could have read that years ago, eh? Yeah. Um, what is his name? Sorry. Yeah. Sam, I think. No, it's Cam- well, the Cameron. Right? Cam- there's a couple of them involved in it, eh? Okay, yeah. But the main cameraman wrote the book. It's pretty cool. Yeah, no, they... To a good product, old actually. Both 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 channels have have done done well. NZ Hunter, obviously, they made this tough and and um, hunt, no, what was it? Uh, Riz Tag Timber came out and they're like, holy yeah. shit, we better up our camera game. Yeah, <laughs> well, that that was really cool. I found that scenario great for me as well because it was like they were competing against Greg and Greg and Willie Durley, right? Yeah, and that kind of made me think of you know the, the guys I compete against. But I think we all kind of just help each other ultimately yeah. and sort of push each other along. I think everyone needs a bit of competition to succeed or to sort of do better. Otherwise, you know, as, as consumers, they're going to get bored as well. Mm. You get sick of going to one place. So, like, you kind of need to mix it up, right? You, you kind of want to see other people's aspects through it. 
and as as like a individual seller i've got different products that i want to promote i'm yeah. not doing what they you know like you got two different owners of two different businesses trying to sell different products so it's cool for your consumer because then they get to see different things which they generally or mightn't have seen at the other shops so yeah. you know we all get to benefit from it from that sort of competition is there, is there much criticism like you're you're present in social me- media mm. like people are pretty passionate about their brands their, their animals and all that yeah. sort of stuff like does that come through into your social media or no uh, I think um, I did a post where two boys had got a, a a massive bloody boar it was for the uh, mango comp 285 yeah, 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 yeah so that was really interesting because i always found that facebook was a bit of a criticism page mm-hmm. and i always felt that instagram was more sort of happy yeah. you know like no one no one's going to bag you out on instagram mate like everyone sort of thumbs up you all the time so that that that's boys with that pig on facebook got ripped a little bit mm-hmm. you know like sneaky or you know how'd you poach that i want to see a video of you actually catching that or you know off farmed fence just the digs at them you know whereas on instagram it was like wow that's great congratulations really cool um so that was the two differences i think on facebook there might be a bit but not so much on instagram yeah you see it's the opportunity to write unlimited <laughs> streams hunting, of hunting comps are the worst man it brings out the mongrels eh? you were over at this um mangakino and state highway five yeah and state highway five two very well run um hunts yeah i particularly like the sh5 just because of the way it was organized with the children in mind and family orientated yeah and a cool location like really good yeah and i think that'll grow a lot more hats off to the organizers on that and the people involved mm. i think they did a great job on it really good and getting, getting Douglas score like oh yeah rock up like get it scored like how, how good is that without a doubt yeah and then was weights as well eh? yeah there's heaps to it I think they got some new categories coming up to make it a bit easier for your public land hunters as well because mm-hmm. I you know there's no way you're going to win any of those comps as a public land hunter <laughs> Glenn Horton <laughs> 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 like you gotta you'd have to be a ninja bro like you, 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 I don't you could have I'd it would be a lot of luck. You've only got what Friday night, really. Yeah. So I don't know where I could go sit on Friday night to find a boogie old death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have tried. I was trying to chat to him, but I don't know. I don't think yeah. swap him a puffer jacket or something. Hey, bro, can I help you out? I, I after, after he'd been to Japan, I thought he wasn't going to shoot, shoot another seeker, but <laughs> shoot, dude, dad loves a competition. Yeah, no, no yeah. Boogie. <laughs> but um, you know, I'm sure they got to work for it too, man. I'm sure they, you know, I'm sure they still got to push for it. Hey. Eh? Um, Oh, you know that, that that's a place that's I bet you has, has taken a lot of restraint to uh, have animals like that. Like that, you know, people bitch and moan about Potanui or or Ngamatia or whatever, but like it doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> nah, like I, <laughs> I've seen some pretty good animals running around Potanui, and like uh, it can actually sometimes be quite hard to pick the one out of the, the all the ones running by. Sometimes when there's more, it's actually harder because they alert each other and then they're fucking gone. Yeah. Um, but uh, nothing beats bush hunting, man. If you can get one in the bush, it's a trophy regardless of what it is, man. Yeah. 100%. Did you see, oh, I can't think of his name, but he put up uh, his um, Capels fellow buck. And he's like, you know, it's not, it's not the biggest fellow buck out there, but it's my biggest Capels fellow buck. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, that's a herd that's no longer um, trophy potential, but in, yeah. the, in the 30s, that was one of the places to go. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty oh, unreal. Yeah, I, 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 some of the biggest joys I've had with it here at the shop, I've, I heard a guy turn up who I follow on Instagram a lot and always comment on him. I just sort of had a bit of a blank. Uh, anyway, he turned up for this miserable looking seeker, Spiker, mm. but he had put it on the back wheel of his car. Nice. <coughs> I'm driven in all the way, especially from like Clements Mill Road. Bro, check this out! Look what I got. Also, R- R- Ricky's uh, almost eight. That was that was good. <laughs> yeah, you know, and um, just so happy with it, eh? Like yeah. those guys. Like, yeah, he's not like Ricky. He got I think some big did, did, I think Ricky's almost eight. One one bear plenty. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you never know what you turn up with on the day. Too, yeah. You know? um, but you know those guys, they they do the hard yards and they generally enjoy it. Like it, it's it's well earned, eh? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a cool place. Good on you, Ricky. Yeah, he, he gave Ricky to you. Ricky Cummins, eh, yeah, is it? Yeah. yeah, and then he pulled into the shop, and, it, and I was like, oh, yeah, see you, patient. I was like, yeah. just, you know, I'll, I'll be free at five, he rocks it. Like, 
quarter to five and lucky I was between them and came out and looked at it, yeah. <laughs> it on the back of the truck. I was but like, you know, he's yeah. he's consistent too. Oh. Like that guy drives there by himself and goes sleeps at the top of the quarry or something, okay. Yeah, he's 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 got it sussed old Ricky. Goes goes all over the place too. And, and at the same time, you know, all over the country. Mm. He's a good person to know. Yeah, lovely guy, genuine guy, and that's what it is with hunting, mate. You meet some really genuine people. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Uh, I'll um, have your uh, Instagram and website in the show notes. Nice, people appreciate it. Fire. Yeah. We, we better not stay here too long or we might freeze. Yeah, come down and get a, a Benny boat. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> See if I can help in a rifle and a boat. Yeah. I haven't I morphed into the boats yet. I don't know if I've quite got there yet, but we're working, working on that. Yeah, what have we got in the back here? One... one one seven five. One fifty. One fifty. Yeah, four hundred fifty. There's actually one of these with a big three hundred on it. Oh. Uh, and I saw the other day we had the we had this Mercury, I think it was, and it was the V twelve or something or the V. Nice. Dude, was that what they had? Six point seven had like four of in the back of those chase boats in the America's Cup. Yeah. So oh, these things so don't sexy. turn. The, the the outboard stays still, and the leg at the bottom turns. Oof. These are like massive things. You need some sort of engineering report on your boat to actually <laughs> attach these things. Eh? Oh, that's beyond me, mate. Yeah. One day. One day. Shoot for the stars, bro. That's right. What keeps you in flow now, Saren? What keeps me going at the moment? Yeah. Caffeine. <laughs> uh, uh, um, that happens so often. Caffeine. At the moment, um, a lot of fitness, trying to do a bit more fitness, to be honest. Um, my wife does really well at the CrossFit. She's competing in that, so I'm trying to join in with her a bit more and get that going. Um, and, you know, as always, just like every other bloke out there of kids, family. Yeah. There's nothing, there's no big secrets or anything great, man. Just kids in the morning cuddles and bedtime and books absolutely that's where it's at bro it's good it's thank stage cheers for the beer cheers no, for the location welcome. thank you <laughs> thanks Mixed Aaron. it up a bit eh? it's yeah, cool absolutely awesome bro <laughs>